That's his desire. In his presence, daily live. How many of us can say we're, we're living daily in his presence? That we haven't picked up some things along the way in our journey that maybe we had let go of early on in our walk. Because when we come into him, many of us came into him weary and heavy laden. And we emptied ourselves and we, we said, God, take all these things. I don't want them anymore. But sometimes along that path and along that journey, stuff can start creeping back in. Our, our mindsets, thoughts, thought processes, um, addictions. Um, we can have injuries and then get medications and then pretty soon you're dependent on medications. You're, there's just all kinds of journeys and stuff that can happen. And those things are no trick. I mean, they are a trick. They're no, they're no plan of God, but they're a trick of the enemy to get us away and out of his presence so that we will take on shame, we will take on guilt, we won't come boldly to the throne room of grace that we'll stay away like a child who's done something wrong. We won't come into the presence of God. We will be steeped in shame and guilt and feel like, and sometimes we put ourselves in time out. We've sinned and then we feel like we need, we need to feel punishment. We need to go and, and spend some time outside of God's presence because we're not worthy to be in his presence. So we put ourselves in time out and we, we feel like maybe we need to beat ourselves a little bit. We need to to make ourselves feel worthy again to come back into his presence. And, and I shared in the first service, that's no different than what happened in the garden. Is that Adam and Eve sinned. And then you see very quickly Adam and Eve decide in their own way that they're going to try to cover it. In their own way, they're going to try to, to be the covering and they're going to try to fix it. They're going to try to, to do it themselves. And you don't even see God really address that. You just see him, in my mind's eye, you see him walk away he knows that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. He knows that they can't be covered without him covering them. So he goes and he kills a couple animals and he provides the skin and the clothing to cover adequately Adam and Eve from their guilt and their shame. In church, that's been going on for 6,000 years. Many of us, we try to put the fig leaves on and sew our own selves up and, and do these things ourselves to make ourselves back right with God. And there's no way except for us to trust in what he has provided. There's a bunch of different religions on the planet. And I will tell you, you can sum them up in these two groups. Those who are putting fig leaves on and those who are allowing the covering. Because when you are doing it in your own works, you're putting fig leaves on. And you have to surrender that and surrender your works and surrender your thoughts and surrender your plan and allow the Almighty One to cover you. And he wants you back in that place of no shame and no guilt. Can you imagine the garden? Adam and Eve were naked. And we think that's a weird thing. It wasn't weird to them. There was no shame. God wants you free. God wants you that free. Now, don't come to church next week without clothes on. <laughs> There's still clothes in heaven now. But that was the plan from the beginning, to be free. Completely free. And that's still his plan today. He doesn't want you in hodgepodge fig leaves or whatever your attempt is to cover. He wants you cleansed, washed, and covered by him. Relying on his covering. Amen? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he wants you free from the shame, free from the guilt. That's why we're going to do this. And, and we're not hiding um, what we're doing with the Conqueror series. We're going to shout it from the rooftops. We're going to bring the light in so it expose all darkness. Amen? Why, I mean, why would we be foolish enough as a church to pretend like it's not happening? It is happening. So the only way to, to fix it is to bring it to Jesus. To shine the light upon it and say, God, we need you. I can't do this in my own strength. It's no different than any other addiction. Except for the enemy's gotten people really, really good about keeping it in the dark. You could talk openly about alcoholism. You could talk openly about addic uh, drug addiction. But if you talk about sexual addiction or pornography, you're some kind of weirdo. But yet 70% of the men and 37% of the women in churches are struggling. So we're saying, look, you're not a weirdo. We understand there's things that have happened in your past. There's exposures. There's all kinds of stuff. Here's the solution, Jesus. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let's get healed. Let's get free. Amen? Let's experience complete freedom. So we're not hiding that. Um, we are, I'm actually encouraging fathers and sons. This has never happened before. But I felt the Holy Spirit say, I want fathers and sons to come. 
fathers and sons, me and my son, my oldest son, we're going. We're going to lead by example. And, and some people might think, you might be foolish enough to think, well, my son's not having that struggle. The way, the way things are happening in schools now, they're getting ideas brought up to them at five years old, at six years old. They are going to start questioning, what is that? And they've got this device that they can search, what is that? What does this mean? And it's boom, it's there. And now they're having to deal with that, process that. So we can either bury our hands, heads in the sand and act like, not my son, not my husband, not my daughter. Or we can see the world that we're in and go, we're going to bring light to this. And we're going to bring Jesus into this conversation. And we're going to get freedom in it. Because I want people free. Amen? Nothing holding me back. No reason to not come boldly into his presence. And that's what he wants. He's provided for the shame and the guilt. The Old Testament just temporarily covered. It didn't provide for the shame and the guilt. But the blood of Jesus... The blood of Jesus takes the stain of shame, takes the stain of guilt, and takes all those things away, and you can stand before him holy as if you've never sinned. You guys should be a lot more excited about that than you are. Are you kidding me? You either don't believe that or you haven't experienced it. He wants you so free that you are not so sin conscious anymore that you're Jesus conscious. Because I was grew up in a church that was always that sin, 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 that sin. You can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. That is not what the Lord wants. The Lord wants you free. He wants you free. He wants you so Jesus conscious and so grace conscious and, and not grace that you can do whatever you want. Grace of God teaches you to not sin. And then you're so Christ conscious that you can see sin and you can sin, but why would you want to go back to that? Because you've been set free from it. Amen? And he's leading you through that, and you see how good his grace is and how abundant his love is, and that he really means what he says when he says, I cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. That, that I've paid the price for all of it. Amen. Do we get that? All of it. So you can be free. You can be seen as if you've never sinned. Amen. Amen. Some of you don't understand that. I don't know if, if you really believe that. That's the truth. What Jesus did was not just this little... He destroyed the power of sin and death. All the sin of the earth was placed upon him and the punishment was paid right there at Calvary. So you don't have to pay your own punishment. You don't have to beat yourself. You don't have to put yourself in time out. It's all been done to him and we can come boldly right into his presence when we've sinned. And if we do sin, not that when we sin, but if you do sin, you have an advocate who goes before the Father who is a kinsman redeemer that has the same flesh and blood that we had and knows the struggle. And he said, Father, you know their struggle. I've experienced it and I've paid the price for it. And, and then we're super, we're, we're so more motivated by the forgiveness and the love of God that it causes us to not want to sin anymore. And we have the Holy Spirit who's inside of us, who loves us, who walks with us. And when we do, or if we do, he will convict us. And we will go, oh, I've grieved the Lord, I've grieved the Holy Spirit. And we can be drawn right back into it and say, oh, God, thank you that you've redeemed me. Thank you that you've paid the price. Thank you that I'm free from that. And it's no longer who I am because I am a new creation in you. The old things have been passed away and all things have become new. That's who I was, but it's not who I am. Thank you. And you walk in a newness and a freshness. And you're not sin conscious, you're Jesus conscious. You're, you're grace conscious. You're so grateful and thankful for what he's done for you. And that motivates you and challenges you to walk in holiness, to walk in what he's already made you. And you're not doing that to earn holiness because you've been made holy by the blood of Jesus. You can't make yourself holier than when the blood of the precious lamb was applied to your life. So you walk in that and you enjoy the grace and the goodness of God and the fruit of the Spirit, and the gifts of the Spirit. And it's not works, it's the grace of God. And He pours those things out in you, and they bubble forth in you naturally, because you're His son, and you're His daughter. And He's placed all those plans and those things in you. He's not trying to take from you. He's not going, you can't have this, you can't have it. He's going, I want you to have it all. Who's experienced that? Who's experienced he's better than you thought? Who's experienced there's more freedom than you ever thought? 
the enemy wants to make like, oh, you can't do that because then you're going to be bound. Are you kidding? He's lead us completely into bondage. His plan and trick is no different no matter what you want to put sin on it, what label it is. He wants to get you way further than you ever dreamed of going to a point that there's no possible way I could get back to Jesus. And then you're hopeless and you're helpless and, you, and the, the obstacle in the mountain's too big. There's no way I could get back there. And he's trying to deceive you till you get to the place of hopelessness and you go, there's no point in this, I'm gonna end it. That's the enemy's plan. And it's the plan every single time. James says, lust, sin, lust turns into sin. When you begin to ponder in your mind and, and meditate, not just have a thought, thoughts come and go, they're like birds. But when those thoughts, and you begin to entertain, entertain those and dwell on those things, then that turns into sin and the action, then you take the action. And if you leave that go, that will turn into death. That's what Paul James says that. Paul says the wages of sin is death. So that's the return on sin. But the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life. And you don't work for that. The wages, you work for death. But that eternal life is a gift. You receive it. You receive it. You take possession of it, and you're so thankful for it. It fully affects your life, and you walk in a new way, and he's put a new song in your heart and a new name inside of you. And the old man dies, and there's a whole new man. I told the first service, that doesn't mean there's not going to be hoops you got to jump through. When I got saved, when I got out of jail and out of Teen Challenge, I still had to do 18 months of, of alcohol program and probation, and I was a felon, all that stuff. But you know what? When I went to those 18 months of, of classes, they got to hear about Jesus. And you know what? I had to be there. <laughs> they could, I, I mean, I tried. I would try to like, man, maybe they'll cut me out of here early. They're gonna get sick of hearing me talk about Jesus. Nope, they gave me 18 months. But guess what? Every single time they would say, well, you know, you have to say you're an alcoholic. I'd be like, no, I'm not. I'm a new creation. Well, well, no, no, but you, no, yeah, I used to be. I was born that. I was a drug addict. I was a sex addict. I was all jacked up. I mean, you name them, I was. But Jesus came and he set me free from all of that. And I'm not wearing that title no more. And then they got to hear about how he did it. And then they got to hear every week about what he was doing in me then. And they'd be sometimes like, well, you know, we need to move. No, you asked me to share. It's my turn. So there may be hoops, but he's going to be right with you as you jump through them. It's not impossible. The enemy's a liar. Every time he's talking to you, he's lying. And we got to grow up and mature to realize that he's a liar. So if he's saying, you can't do that, you'll never be free. You just begin to go, oh, thank you, devil. What you're telling me then is that I can be free because you're a liar. What else you got? Like, what else you want to tell me that I can't do and I can't be because I know that won't be true. And he's, then he's like, let me go back and think, figure something else out. And he will. He'll go figure out another way to try to come at you. But you do not believe the lies of him. Believe the word. When Satan came to Jesus, what did Jesus use? The word. Did Satan try to twist it? Yeah. So you better know it. So when he comes, you bring the word right back. Like, I don't think so. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Yeah, yeah, I did all that stuff, but that doesn't mean anything. Jesus cleansed me from that. He sees me as if I've ever sinned. What else you got? Thank you for reminding me, though. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I am his son. That's joy. That's peace. That's power. That's freedom. But if you do, you have an advocate. You have an advocate. It's like going to court and the, and the court is stacked on your side. Man, I've been to court many times and it wasn't stacked on my side. But can you imagine going to court, you have the prosecutor who's the accuser of the brethren, Satan, and bringing all these charges and rallying against you. And then you have a defensive attorney who is the son of the judge. That's a good day in court. <laughs> That's a good day in court. I'm feeling pretty good about that court day. And he's bringing the charges, and Jesus goes, Dad, I paid for that. It's all been paid for. My blood paid for that. I redeemed that. 
Case dismissed. You're pardoned. And I've experienced a full pardon from the Lord, which is the most important one, and a full pardon from the state. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing to be pardoned, to be free, all your rights restored. That's a good day. Amen? So men, women, children of all ages, walk in freedom. He's better than you think. He's so much better than you think. I don't think there's anyone that's ever met Jesus, met my Jesus. Because there's different Jesuses, I've learned. But the one I met, if you met him, you've never said, I don't know, you weren't as good as I thought. Your plan wasn't as good as I thought. If you met my Jesus, you're going like, what? You're awesome. I didn't even know I even would like that. And he's like, I know, but I just wanted to show you. Check it out. And you're like, oh. he's not trying to take anything from you, church. He came to give. And he gave himself away. He showed what love looks like. He laid down his life. He didn't take nothing from you. The church needs to quit taking things from people. The church is here to give. He squeezed out every drop of his life so that we could have it and have it in abundance. And we're supposed to be a poured out drink offering, are we not? Pouring out our life just like he did. Not because it's a law or I have to, because I get to. <laughs> I get to. I get to serve Jesus. I get to be used by God. And it's fun. It's fun seeing God use you. It's fun seeing people get free. Amen. It's fun unlocking people's cells and watching them come out and play. That's awesome. So come out. Walk in the light as he's in the light. And have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you from what? Say that again. All sin. All all sin but you got to walk in the light as he's in the light and you got to have fellowship with him that means you can't stay out of his presence you got to run into his presence you got to stay in his presence amen amen that's what freedom looks like well praise the lord i think i might preach today <laughs> i might teach today who knows what might happen today the first service those poor Steve back there. He's, you guys pray for Steve today. He was trying to follow me today, and good Lord, the Holy Spirit was having fun. If he can stick with what I'm doing today, that'll be good. We're going to attempt to get into Revelation chapter 5. And uh, for those of you who are, haven't been here for a little while, we're going to do some catch-up. I'll reread Five verses one through six or seven. This is a point, and I, I'm just going to say I believe this is the most important moment. And I can't say history because it hasn't happened yet. It's the most important moment in God's universal plan. What we were about to, what we've been studying, the throne room, where the the scroll and the title deed to God's plan of complete freedom on the earth where there's no sin, there's no um, death, there's no, his complete redemption plan. This is the, probably the most important thing that's going to happen. Paul said that all heaven in, in, in creation is an anticipation. We as the body and the Christ, we are an anticipation of this. And it's a great thing. So it says, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book or a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book? Who is worthy to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. And I began to weep. So John is weeping, not just because... No one could open the book, but he, this is really the whole plan of redemption. He knows everything that he's, that he's learned as a young man and the prophecies that he studied and the day, that day that is to come for his people, for the, the millennium and for the, the, the Jewish people to be reinstated 
and for God to dwell with them. This, is, this has to happen for that. And if it, that scroll doesn't open, the title deed to that has to be opened. So no one was able, and he begins to lose it. All of his hopes, all, all that is like shattered. And the angel says, it says, one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. Now, in previous weeks, we've looked at all that. And I will remind you, from this point forward in the book of Revelation, every title for Christ is Jewish. The titles to the church before that were not Jewish. They were the titles that were laid out in Revelation chapter 1. And from this point forward, all the titles of Jesus are Jewish. Now, I would say that that fits along with uh, Daniel. And when Jesus says in Matthew 24 and, and Luke 19 that, that he's speaking to, who is he speaking to? The Jewish people. He's speaking to Jewish disciples. Daniel's um, prophecy that he gave, he said, Daniel, this prophecy is for you and your people and your city, Jerusalem. In Jacob's distress, in Jeremiah, he said, this is a time of Jacob's troubles, this 70th week, this uh, uh, tribulation period. This main emphasis is on the Jewish people. Not that there's not going to be non-Jewish people going through that, but the main focus, and that's what has been prophesied. And I want you to see the pattern as we're going through redemption, as we're going to look in Isaiah 11 and probably 59 and who knows what else. Um, there's this whole pattern that's always been that there's going to be judgment and then millennium time. So this has always been the pattern, and we need to see that all through Scripture. And it's consistent that he's speaking, and, and even the titles from this point forward are all Jewish. And, and we looked at that last week and, and last couple of weeks. The lion that is from the tribe of Judah and the root of David has overcome so as to open the books and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain. It's so interesting is that he says, who can open the book? He says, behold, the lion that's from the tribe of Judah. And at this point, you should expect to see when they turn, who, what are they going to see? You would think a lion. But what do they see? A lamb standing as if slain. And that's good news. That lamb isn't in the ground. That, that, that lamb resurrected and is standing. John's seeing Jesus standing on his feet alive. But he's seen him in a different place with seven horns, which represents all power and authority, cosmic power, like like Star Wars kind of power, university, you know, universal galaxies, everything. That is the seven horns, all of it. And then seven eyes, which we're going to look at a little bit more today. And he says, And I saw between the throne the four living creatures, the elders, a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So we see earlier that the seven spirits of God are resting on the seven candlesticks in the throne room. And now you see the seven spirits of God as seven eyes. And we'll unfold that a little bit as we go too. It says, and he came and he took it out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. I guarantee you there's only one worthy to do that. To come to the right hand of God and take that scroll and take possession of it. That's the kinsman redeemer. That's our Jesus. So we left off in Isaiah chapter 11. And for giggles, I'm going um, to read it this time um, in, in the NLT. I just like how it flows a little bit here. Um, don't worry about that, Steve. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about some of these other verses we'll look at in the ones that you have in the New American Standard. So that'll be um, Isaiah 10 and 12 here in a minute. It says, Out of the stump of David's family, Isaiah 11, out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot. He was, Jesus was just called the shoot, was he not? So here we go. Out of the stump of David's family, and it's a stump because what had happened? The kings had been stopped. They, they had been in captivity the kingly line had ceased and been cut off, it looked like, but there's a branch that's beginning to sprout up out of that stump. Who is Jesus? He says, he will grow a shoot, yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, or reside in him, actually, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by appearance, nor make a decision based on hearsay. He will give justice to the poor and make fair decisions for the exploited. Did you notice something? That's so cool that he is not going to be judging by what he sees and by what he hears only. That's how we judge, is it not? Can, we be, can our eyes be fooled? Yes. Oh, yeah. 
People can dress up on Sunday, as Rick was saying, right? I dressed up, I did all those things, and everything, everybody thought everything was great. Can our ears be fooled? Yes. Oh, yeah. We can tell people what they want to hear. Jesus isn't judging that way. I think, I think you have to pass the sniff test. <coughs> he's using some different senses. And I think he's sniffing out the fear of the Lord. That's what it says. So if you don't have the fear, the Bible says in, in um, uh, Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning. Now, thank God, that doesn't mean that's the end. That's, that's, we, we all start right there. You better have a healthy fear of God. So you can say what you want, you can do what you want, but if there's no fear of the Lord, you ain't going to get that by him. He's going to go, I smell that. Amen? Yeah. So, where did I leave off there? And verse, verse 4. He will give justice to the poor, make fair decisions for the exploited. The earth will shake at the force of his word, and one breath from his mouth will destroy the wicked. Wow, that sounds like Revelation um, chapter 20, does it not? 19. Jesus is going to come into, out of the sword of his mouth. He's going to conquer. So it's not, it's not an actual sword. It's the word. The Bible's seen as a sword, is it not? That's our offensive weapon. It's a sword. So he's going to speak. And, hand, and I want you to see this pattern. He's dealing with some judgment right here. Now, what happens after this judgment is you're going to see. It says he will wear righteousness like a belt, verse 5, truth like an undergarment. That's a way to say he's girding himself up in truth. In that day, now remember that, that phrase, in that day. In that day, the wolf and the lamb will lie together. The leopard will lie down with the baby goat. The calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion. And a little child will lead them all. The cow will graze near the bear. The cub and the calf will lie down together. The lion will eat hay like a cow. The baby will play safely near the hole of a cobra. Yes, a little child will put its hand in a nest of deadly snakes without harm. Nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For as the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. In that day, the heir to David's throne will be a banner of salvation to who? All the world. The nations will rally to him, and the land where he lives will be a glorious place. In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to bring back the remnant of his people... Those who remain in Assyria and northern Egypt and southern Egypt, Ethiopia and Elam and Babylonia, Hamath and all the distant coastlands. He will raise a flag among the nations and assemble the exiles of Israel. He will gather the scattered people of Judah from the ends of the earth. Now, I would, in my humble opinion, say I have not seen that happen yet. And I don't know of a time where in that day where the wolf and the lamb have lied together. The leopard lies down with the baby goat. The calf and the yearling lie safe with the lion. Little childs lead and guide the cows and the, the bears. The cubs and the calves lie down together. The lion is eating hay like a cow. The baby plays safely in the hole of a cobra. Can you imagine? In that day. I mean, there is no destruction in that day. What day is that? Thousand years. Yeah, a millennium period where... The nations rule and are gathered under his banner. They're recognizing who he is, and they're running towards him from all over the world. It says to the ends of the earth, the coastlands. And there's peace on the earth. Can you imagine when a day where you see your little child running up with a cobra, and you're like, oh, that's really cool. That's, yeah, that one's a pretty color. No, that's like, or got the, got the rattlesnake. And it's just, zzz, and they're like, isn't it the cutest little rattle? Oh, that's cool. That's how it's going to be. There is no destruction. That time period has not happened. So on that day is future, in my humble opinion. Also, in that day, the heir to David's throne will be a banner of salvation to all the world. The nations will rally around him. Have the nations all rallied around him. And the land where he lives will be a glorious place. In that day, the Lord will reach out with his hand a second time to bring back the remnant of his people those who remain in Assyria, northern Egypt. So the cool thing is, is that day, and part of that is actually happening right now, the beginning of it. You say, Pastor Steve, you, where are we at? 1948, Israel became a nation. People from all, the dispersed from all over the world began coming back to Israel. We are actually watching that happen right now. We are in the midst of that. 
Are they all there yet? No. I believe it's in Zechariah. It prophesies of a time that in that day that there will be so many back in Israel that they will be outside the walls, outside the borders of Jerusalem, and that God will have to protect them. We're not there yet. Now, Israel is trying to figure out with all these Jews coming back home, where are we going to put them all? Like, that's happening. So, so that hasn't fully happened yet. I can see that the lions and the lambs aren't lying together. There's not peace on the earth. We get little glimpses of this, though. I, w- I would dare say anytime there's been true revival, it's kind of what it looks like. True revival, the, 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 con- the conflicts that are amongst people, the issues that happen in churches, when true revival hits, it's like that. It's like God's plan. It's like, this is what it's supposed to look like. The lion and lamb can lay together. Wherever there was odd or issues, all people from all around the world come together in one heart, one mind, one spirit, like I intended. That's what revival looks like. And if revival doesn't produce that, you had emotion. You had some good, powerful songs and some good things might have happened. But if it doesn't turn out like that, then it's probably not revival. It's quiet. <laughs> Just noticing. <laughs> What are you saying, Pastor Steve? I'm just saying that I see this as this looks like God's plan. This looks like how it was in the garden. This looks like what he wants to do again. And when he pours out his spirit and he shows up in conflicts and problems, all that stuff starts getting dissolved and there's peace. But we haven't seen a worldwide peace like this yet. Amen? Okay. All right. So in Isaiah 11, 10, and 12, it says, On that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse. And that's in the New American Standard. That resort means to turn to rally. They are turning to rally. That almost, like also that word resort, when you go to resort, you can relax. You're, all the nations will resort to the root of Jesse. That's to Jesus, who will stand as a signal flag for his people. And his resting place will be glorious. Now there's a, <laughs> goes on to in verse 11, then it will happen what? on that day, the Lord will again recover with his hand the second time. So that means there's already happened once before, right? The remnant of his people who will remain from Assyria, Egypt, Pathos, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, from the islands of the sea, and he will lift up a flag for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel and will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So we see that Israel was dispersed. But he says a second time he's going to bring them all out. So when was the first? And there's, here's, a, here's a, we can draw split hairs and you can think differently and it's totally okay. Um, there's lots of great commentaries and lots of great comment, commenters and lots of great PhDs that, that think that the first time was um, under the return from Babylon. Um, I don't think so. I think if you keep reading and you go through this chapter, he says in verse 16, that he speaks of Israel coming out of Egypt. I personally think that was the first time. And here's why. Everyone came out of Egypt. Every one of the Jews left Egypt. When there was um, an exodus out of Babylon, not all Israel came out. So I wouldn't qualify that as the first time. But if there's a lot of great people that think, and I'm not going to split hairs over that. Okay. But let's talk about the second time. (laughs) So... So the first time, I believe, is from Egypt in verse 16. If you keep reading, well, here, I'll read it for you. And they said at the end of the chapter, and they said to the mountains and to the rocks, oh, my bad, I'm in Revelation. Verse 16, this Bible. He will make a highway for the remnant of his people, the remnant coming from Assyria, just as he did for Israel long ago when they returned from Egypt. Okay, so you're not taking my word for it. But I'm okay if you think different. But here's, here's something I want you to see. Some believe the second time was returned from Babylon under Cyrus. However, that's only partial return. Many remain scattered. And here's what I can show you. The books of Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther show that as well. They're still scattered. You with me? Let me show you something else. Um, The books of Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, also the New Testament books of Acts, James, and 1 Peter, still scattered. How do I know that? Well, Acts chapter 2 says, Now there were Jews residing in Jerusalem, devout men from Every nation under heaven. Remember that cool little time when Jesus baptized all of his people in power with tongues and baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire came down upon them? And they began to speak in other languages. Hmm. 
Why were they speaking in other languages? Because their brethren were from all over the world that were all there for Pentecost. And fun little side note, I think, is remember God split their languages all up in Babel. Now he baptizes the church and the Holy Spirit is like, let me fix your languages. Now you all can talk again. Isn't that cool? They're, they're talking. They don't know what they're talking. They're like, I just about that, about that. And he's like, hey, all these guys are speaking our language. Like, what? How is that? They're like, oh, they're drunk. Right. Sure. Like, usually, I, I'll just not say usually. Every single time you get drunk, you digress. <laughs> you don't increase in knowledge somehow. Like, oh, oh, I got drunk, and all of a sudden, all these great things happened. Never said anyone who ever got drunk. I don't hear anyone saying, no, Pastor, you're wrong. Good. I mean, like, you're the one and only, or a liar, one or the other. <laughs> so that's, that's one instance. We see they're dispersed. James 1.1, 1, 1. James said, a bondservant of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. He opens up his book this way. To the 12 tribes, who? The 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. James was the pastor to, who, what? Jerusalem church, the Jewish church. Greetings to the dispersed. So they're still dispersed. 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who were chosen. Still scattered. There was even a greater scattering after the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And yet again, after AD 70, after the Bar Kokhba revolt in AD 132 through 135, big revolt happens. And they are even dispersed even greater. So that day, what are we talking about? That day must refer to a restoration at the end of this age. In my opinion, that day is future. I think we're getting close. That day. When you go through and you read all through um, the prophets, and you read through Zechariah, there's always speaking of that day, that day, that day. And every time, there's, you're going to see there's a time of judgment, and then there's a, like a millennial period of things that have not happened yet. You can see very clearly, this hasn't happened yet. There, we are still, and all creation is waiting for that day. And why am I preaching that? And why am I talking about that? Because we're in the throne room, and there's a title deed to that day. That is the title deed. And Jesus is the only one that can take possession and open those seals to start that happening. And for a believer, that is a greatest day. You are looking forward and excited for that. And if you're not, that's not a good day. So you better be on the right side of that. Because it's, it, i got to address this. I, I get people that are getting scared. They're talking, well, I, don't, I can't come listen to you pastor preach on Revelation because it's just scary. It's just doom and gloom. I'm like, what are you listening to? This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. How are you scared about the revelation of Jesus? The unveiling of Jesus. This is a glorious thing to study. Who doesn't want to see Jesus unveiled? Or who wouldn't want to see Jesus unveiled? Better question. I know that Satan wouldn't want Jesus unveiled. The Antichrist wouldn't want us to have Jesus unveiled and really understand and see him as he really is and know what his plan is for us. But yet, I'm going to go there, might as well. But yet, you have um, post-trib or pre-wrath or all these different people who I've been watching. And I watch a lot of stuff, okay? Thank you for your videos of like, Pastor, this guy says that you're a Satanist because you think about pre-tribulation. Come on. But here's some stuff. I'm just going to disprove a couple of things. And maybe next week I'll go over a bunch. But here's a couple quick things. For one, um, I'm pretty sure, I could, I could say I'm pretty confident that I'm not being influenced right now by, by the Antichrist. I wouldn't say that someone that's pre-wrath is. You can have a different opinion. You can think differently about eschatology. I'm not going to say you're under the influence of demonic. But somehow I am, according to pre-wrath and whatever other titles you want. Okay, that's just wrong. The fruit of the Spirit is pretty simple, right? Amen. What has been the fruit of what our teaching has brought? Knowledge. Knowledge, wisdom, an unveiling of Jesus, and that people are more excited about Jesus than they have been. Is that not so? Yes. Okay. Here's, the, here's one of their big arguments. Well, if you're a pre-tribber, there is no word tribulation in the Bible. What? Tribulation's not in the Bible. So you guys are whack. Okay. Well, is the word tribulation in the Bible? No. 
The word harpazo in the Greek is, which is called snatching away. Snatching away. The word rapturo is in the Latin Bible, which is where we get our English word rapture. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. Here's, here's another thing they say. Well, just because it's inferred like a hundred and something times doesn't mean it's in the Bible. Really? Okay, so if we use that theology and philosophy, there is no trinity. It's not in the Bible. I don't see no trinity word in the Bible. So how do we get God's a trinity? A triune God. How? It's inferred a bunch. All, a lot of times in scriptures, is it not? We see like, well, God's the Father? Yeah, okay, well, the Father was there. God's Jesus? Yeah, he said he was. Well, he's there too. God's the Holy Spirit? Yeah, well, how are they all three there separately but one? It's like a triune God. No, it's not because it's not in the Bible. You see my reasoning and ration there? Here's another fun one. The Bible's not in the Bible, so we probably shouldn't believe that either. The word Bible's not in the Bible. Rapture's not in the Bible, so those guys are quacks. They're demonic. That's not even in the Bible. <laughs> they say, that's a new teaching. It came from Darby in the 1800s. I'm so tired of people repeating that, parrots. Go do some real homework. I already showed you guys, like, all the way back from, like, 135 on. Pre-tribulation rapture is not a new thing. If, if you go do some homework, you're going to see. Now, I will tell you the truth on both sides. Was there post-trib thought way back then, too? Yes. There's always been two different thoughts. But I can tell you all the way back as far as, as Paul, when he's talking to the Thessalonians, saying um, they're freaked out because they're dealing with tribulation. And Paul's already taught them that, look, you're going to get raptured before the tribulation. So they're going through tribulation, and they're freaked out thinking they missed it. And Paul's like, look, you haven't missed it. The Antichrist hasn't came and established himself, so don't worry. Here's another argument that pre-wrath and what other titles you want will say that me as a pre-tribber, you guys are just like, you don't want to go through tribulation. You don't, you don't think that the church is going to have troubles and blah, 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 blah. No, we're Christians, and I know my history. For 2,000 years, Christians have been getting persecuted. Just because it hasn't happened in great spots here in America doesn't mean it ain't. And if it does, it's not going to change my belief one way, shape, or form. Here's what has never happened that I see in Scripture. God has not poured his wrath out on the righteous. I haven't seen that. I haven't seen. And some people, they will say, well, they'll say that like there's these different, they're inferring these types and things. But, well, yeah, how would you get to know God? I know him by what I've dealt with him and how he spoke to me and the things that he's revealed to me and what I've seen of him. Is that fair? What I've read through the word, I can see consistent patterns of things that he does and things that he doesn't do. Is that fair? How else do we know somebody? If you're around someone, you know somebody, I wouldn't have to, to listen very long if someone told, said something really, really evil about Craig. I've been around Craig long enough that I know his qualities. I know the things that he does. And it's like a bizarre, like, this is so, I'm like, I don't even really have to talk to him. Like, that sounds just whack. You following me? So when I see all through scripture that God's always been faithful, he's, he's, he's always taken the righteous out before he's poured out wrath and judgment. And he says, like, that's what he'll do. He says, if you're an overcomer, I'm going to spare you from that. And we've looked at all that. I mean, we've, we've, are you with me? Yes. Like, how else are you going to know what God's like? Now, that would be so foreign if all of a sudden God's like, surprise, I'm switching it up. I'm going to, at the very end, when I'm going to pour out all my judgment, all my wrath that this world has never seen before, I'm going to dump it on my righteous. Surprise. Now, I will tell you this. If that happened, it's not going to change my theology at all. It's not going to change what I'm going to do. I'm going to get up in the morning. I'm going to drink my cup of coffee. And I'm going to get in the word like I always do. Shocking. You know why? Because that's what I've always done. And I don't have to. Now, look, if, if, you, if you are the type that you think I need to store up a bunch of food, you feel like you need to do that, 
That's okay. I'm not going to tell you not to. I'm not feeling that. I'm not feeling the Lord tell me, like, you need to build a bunker and you need to store up. Like, I don't feel that. But if you feel that, it's okay. Build a bunker. Store it all up. If I run out, I'll knock on your door. <laughs> but here's what I believe. I've seen God's faithfulness all through when the children of Israel came out of Egypt. He parted waters for them. He provided manna from heaven. He, Jesus said, I care more for you than I, the birds of the air, and they don't store up in, in, in barns. Is that not what he said in Matthew 7? He said, don't store up your treasures. Like, store them up in heaven. Like, don't worry about, like, I got you. Did he not feed Elijah with ravens? So just in case, I'm still not too worried. God's faithful. He's either faithful or he's not. Church, he's either faithful or he's not. And my Bible says he's faithful even when I'm not faithful because he can't go against what he is. He's faithful. That's Bible. And have I not, just humor me for a minute, have I not, since we started this, shown you over and over and over scripturally what we're, what we're preaching and teaching? Okay. Can, can that be interpreted differently? Yep. Can I still call you brother if you disagree with my eschatology? Yes. But you better not call me demonic because I'm going to have a problem with that. I'm just saying. Like, then, you, then I don't know for brother because, bro, you don't got no love. I wouldn't say you're demonic or you're being demonically in, in, imposed or because you think of that you're going to go through tribulation. I would never do that. That's not right. Like, so there's a few reasons. And, and I'm probably going to go into a pretty good teaching because I want to settle this stuff. <laughs> but all right, commercial's over. Thank you, Lord. I guess. Are you guys all right? Okay. Back to the dispersed. <laughs> there, was, there was an even greater scattering. That day is referring to the restoration at the end of the age. Finishing up on the seven eyes, or just, just bringing us back, those are the seven spirits of God, and, and in that case is coming as wisdom, spirit of understanding, spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of the fear of the Lord, the, the quick, spirit of quick understanding, um, this prophecy described in advance, these very seven spirits of God, which were come to view as the seven eyes of the Lamb. Remember earlier, you saw the seven spirits of God on the seven uh, lampstands, right? That's what he said. The seven, that was the seven spirits of God. Now you see the seven spirits of God as seven eyes, and you're going to see Zechariah talking, and they're going to and fro throughout the earth. Pretty cool. You following me? Yeah. All right. His horns show, show his fullness of power and authority. His eyes show his fullness of intellectual and spiritual power. There is nothing he doesn't know. There is nothing that surprises him. You're not going to throw him off guard. He has all superior power and understanding. He sees it all inside and out. You can't hide nothing from him. Amen? How freeing is that? Don't even try. It's like, it's like look, you do something. Just telling yourself, I messed up. He saw it anyways. We're foolish when we try to hide. Right? Adam and Eve. It's an all-searching intelligence and divine, that has divine understanding. Seven eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth. In Zechariah chapter 3, verse 8 and 9, Zechariah says this, Now listen, Joshua, you high priest, and, and your friends who are sitting in front of you, indeed, they are men who are a symbol. For behold, I am going to bring in my servant, the branch. There it is again. For behold, the stone that I have put before Joshua, on one stone are seven eyes. Behold, I am going to engrave. Now, who's the stone? Who's the branch? Jesus. And behold, I'm going to engrave an inscription on it, declares the Lord of armies, and I will remove the guilt of the land in one day. The seven eyes mentioned all the way back. Isn't, isn't God awesome? He has given Zechariah and Isaiah like all of this prophecy of what's to come. And then the book of Revelation, unveiling of Jesus, we're seeing... This is that. And that's the most amazing thing. When you start studying the book of Revelation, you better get, you're going to get real familiar with Old Testament. Because it is all, guess what? Jesus is in the Old Testament. All through it. That pattern is there over and over and over so that we will see. And Revelation, he's going, let me, let me uncover it all for you. Amen? That's awesome. So now just for a second, I want to, I want to, to read Romans, 
um, chapter 11. And I'm going to do that. Uh, I'm going to do that in NLT. And why am I doing that? Because there's people that think that um, the church has replaced Israel. That is, a, that is nonsense. And I'm not going to give you my opinion on that. We're going to see biblically. How's that? Is that fair? Yeah. Cool. Well, just for free, this is a free one. It starts off, um, Paul starts off in chapter 11. And I, it's almost like God actually knows, like, what's going to come in the future. Right. It's almost like God knows, like, there's going to be some people questioning some things. So I'm going to go ahead and tell these guys, like, a thousand years before it happens, like, here's the answer. Right? Almost like he knows. Not that he knows everything, but it's almost. <laughs> he says, in chapter 11, he says, I asked then, has God rejected his own people, the nation of Israel? Of course not. That should settle that, right? Has God rejected his people Israel? Of course not. This goes on. I myself am an Israelite and a descendant of Abraham and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. No, God has not rejected his own people whom he chose from the very beginning. Do you realize that the scriptures say about this? Elijah the prophet complained to God about the people of Israel and said, Lord, they have not killed your prophets and torn down your altars. Lord, haven't they? He says, I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. So anyways, I'm going to skip ahead. But that's a pretty good no, yeah. right? Now let's jump to verse 11, and I'm going to read a pretty good passage, but you can't do it better than the Word of God. Verse 11, did God's people stumble and fall beyond recovery? Still speaking of Israel. Of course not. They were disobedient. So God made salvation available to the Gentiles. But when he wanted his own people to become jealous and claim it for themselves. Now, if the Gentiles were enriched because the people of Israel turned down God's offer of salvation, think how much greater a blessing the world will share when they finally accept it. Well, when's that going to happen? <laughs> that day? Hmm, maybe. <laughs> He says, I'm saying all this, verse 13, I am saying all this, especially for you Gentiles. God has appointed me as the apostle to the Gentiles. I stress this, for I want somehow to make the people of Israel jealous of what you Gentiles have. So I might save some of them. Is, are Jewish people getting saved today? Yes. Is he saving some of them? Yes. Okay. I'm glad you answered that. Verse 15, for since their rejection meant that God offered salvation to the rest of the world, their acceptance will be even more wonderful. It will be life for those who were dead. And since Abraham and the other patriarchs were holy, their descendants will also be holy. Just as the entire batch of dough is holy because the portion given as an offering is holy. For if the roots of the tree are holy, the branches will be too. But some of the branches from Abraham's tree, some of the people of Israel have been broken off. And you Gentiles, who were branches from a wild olive tree, have been grafted in. So now, when? Now, you also receive the blessing God has promised Abraham and his children. You've received that blessing too, church. That's beautiful. That doesn't mean you replace them. He says, sharing in the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. But you must not brag about being grafted in to replace the branches that were broken off. Wow, that's pretty plain, ain't it? Right. If you got replacement theology, uh, you probably should read that. <clears throat> Don't brag about being grafted in to replace the branches that were broken off. You are just a branch, not the root. Well, you may say those branches were broken off to make room for me. Yes, but remember, those branches were broken off. Why? Because they didn't believe in Christ. And you are there because you do believe. So don't think highly of yourself, but fear what could happen. For if God did not spare the original branches, he won't spare you either. <clears throat> now, I had some thoughts come up this week on eternal salvation. Now, I'm not, I'm not one to tell you, and I, I think anyone that says they know right where that line is, I don't trust them. Pentecostal people usually go, like, you better get saved every week. I mean, I remember people like, hey, we're having an altar call every week, and good Lord, if you messed up at all, you better get saved every week. <clears throat> I don't believe that. But I also don't believe there ain't nothing you can do to lose your salvation. And I can give you a bunch of different places, but this one just popped up for free. Let's read that again. 
Well, you, must, you may say those branches were broken off to make room for me. Yes, but remember, those branches were broken off because they didn't believe in Christ. And you are there because you do believe. So don't think highly of yourself, but fear what could happen. For if God did not spare the original branches, why didn't he spare them? Their unbelief and their disobedience. Unbelief is disobedience. When you don't do what God says because you don't believe. So... What did he say? So don't think highly of yourself, but fear what could happen. For if God did not spare the original branches, he won't spare you either. Hmm. Notice how God is both kind and severe. He is severe toward those who disobeyed, but kind to you. If you continue to trust. Whoa. If you continue to trust. Kind of sounds like he's speaking pretty plain there. In his kindness. But if you stop trusting, you also will be cut off. That's pretty plain. I don't know how we can misread that. He's like, I've done this before. If you quit trusting, you quit believing, you quit walking in obedience, I can cut you off. So don't get too high-minded. Because if I cut off the original and grafted in a wild one, isn't that what he's saying? Am I, am I, is Steve Dennison in it that too much? That's what he's saying. And if the people of Israel turn from their unbelief, they will be grafted in again. For God has the power to graft them back into the tree. You by nature were a branch cut off from a wild olive tree. So if God was willing to do something contrary to nature by grafting you into his cultivated tree, he will be far more eager to graft the original branches back into the tree where they belong. He says, I want you to understand this mystery, dear brothers and sisters, so that you will not feel proud about yourselves. Some of the people of Israel have, hurt, have hard hearts, but this will last only until the full number of Gentiles comes to Christ. Ooh. That day. No man knows the day nor the hour. Of what? Till the full number of Gentiles come then that age is going to end. Remember Revelation chapter 3, Meditata, after these things. What was after that? What was before that? The church, after these things. Until that full number of Gentile believers come in, boom, now, now we're switching to that seventh week, that final, that final week, Daniel's 70th week, that final seven years. That's the focus. And it is to bring Israel back to himself. It is to get Israel's attention. That's why he's bringing the two witnesses that are what? Jewish. Who are more than likely what I see in scripture. Moses and who? Elijah. Who do they represent? The law and the prophets. Who better to get Israel's attention? To go, you missed it. And then who better that's prophesied all throughout scripture that it says five to ten Gentiles will be clinging to one Jewish man's robe because they know the way to Christ. There's 144,000 what? Jewish men who have not soiled their garments, who are pure, that are going to be evangelizing the world. And I think, and I could be wrong, but I think there will be more people come to the Lord during that time than probably ever has. That's how good our God is. And I've never saw that until I really started studying Revelation and seeing it's all about redemption. All of this. He wants to redeem and it's always been his plan. Look, don't get rid of Israel. I'm not done with them. They were in disobedience. And, I told, and he told them way to dance. But they've been looking for that day. That day in church. We're looking for it too. We're not on opposing sides. We're like, yeah. We don't replace Israel. We've been grafted in. Thank God. We honor Israel. We pray for Israel. I don't know in case the church forgets. Jesus is a Jew. He's not blonde-haired, blue-eyed. He's Middle Eastern. I think he looks like the guy on The Chosen, personally. <laughs> that's my Jesus. I love that guy. I'm like, that's pretty close to how I see God. Good Lord, where are we at? (laughs) 
Verse 25, I want you to understand the mystery, dear brothers and sisters, so that you will not feel proud about yourselves. Some of the people of Israel have hard hearts, but this will last only until the full number of Gentiles comes to Christ. And so all Israel will be saved. As the scriptures say, the one who rescues will come from Jerusalem, and he will turn Israel away from ungodliness. And this is my covenant with them, that I will take away their sins. Many of the people, and that's Isaiah 50, uh, 59. I wish I could go there. It's so awesome. I did with the first group, but you guys, are, you're not listening quick enough, so. <laughs> go read Isaiah 59 and 60. It's super awesome. But you're going to see a pattern in 59 that, that Jesus puts on the righteousness. He puts on his helmet. He puts on his breastplate, and he goes, and he lays the smack down pretty much. He's bringing justice. He's bringing, and then it goes into the millennial reign. Wow, it's the same pattern. On that day, <laughs> on that day, oh, it's so awesome. God is so awesome. I love his word. It says, many of the people of Israel are now enemies of, God, of, of the good news, and this benefits you Gentiles. Yet they are still the people he loves because he chose their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. Once you Gentiles were rebels against God. But when the people of Israel rebelled against him, God was merciful to you instead. Now they are the rebels, and God's mercy has come to you so that they too will share in God's mercy. For God has, and this is not a good, it, it, it'll work. He, God has imprisoned everyone, which really means included together. So everyone's been included in the mercy. For God has imprisoned everyone, or he's included everyone in disobedience so that he could have mercy on everyone. He's deemed all of us. You're all, you've all been disobedient. I had a plan for you, and I gave you out all the covenants, and we did this over and over, and you keep messing it up. You're basically all included in this disobedience. Amen. So that, so that, why? Why did God include us all in that disobedience? Here's the kicker. So that we could all be included in his mercy. And if you keep reading, oh, God's word is so awesome. It just keeps getting better. It says, for God has imprisoned everyone in disobedience so he could have mercy on everyone. Oh, how great are God's riches and his wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. You guys, I can tell you, I don't know all there is to know. But I tell you, the more excited I get every time I start reading and studying more about this, I'm like, I'm like a little kid in a candy store that keeps finding these little nuggets. And I'm like, oh, he's, he's awesome. Like, oh, my gosh. Like, do you see this pattern? It's the God that's outside of our time and world and dimension, like thousands of years before was like, watch this, pink. Thousand years later, watch this. He is like outside of time and he's, he's an extraterrestrial being that is speaking into our world and it's evidence. Like I dare you to challenge you to read the Bible and study it. You don't think there's a God. I dare you. I double dog dare you. Like try to disprove, like he is so ridiculously awesome. The more I study this, the more I'm just like, whoa. How, I mean, how do we know him? Because he wants to be known and he reveals himself. He's like, come on, let me show you some more. And that's never going to end, by the way. I believe eternity is going to be that. Come on, let me show you some more. Come on. Like, can you imagine? We're like limited dimensions. What when they all lift? By the way, lift up the Root family. Jackie Root got to cross that finish line. She crossed that barrier. She went into all the dimensions. She is with Jesus around the throne room, seen as if she's never seen before, completely healed, completely restored, in full strength, and she's having the time of her life. So we're not praying for her. We're praying for Roger and his kids. But that's the truth, you guys. She heard, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now enter into rest, where there's no pain, where the lion and the cobra can lie together, where, like, there is no issues. There's no pain. There's no sin. There's no sickness. There's no disease. Everything is awesome. Like, forever. And she's outside of time. Like, she's not like, 
well, I'm just, if you all rest, you could get here. You know, I'm going to have to wait a long time. She's outside of that. She's going to be like, Jesus is going to be talking to her. She's going to be doing some stuff. And all of a sudden, you're like, hey, guess what, guys? Let me show you. There's no limits. Can you imagine that freedom? That's our goal. She got to break through. She went in to the throne. She is with Jesus. She, she has the mind of God. Like she knows fully and is known fully. Can you imagine? Oh, what a day that's going to be. That day. Donnie, that day. This day is like, eh. But that day. Whew. This ain't a scary gospel, guys. Revelation is not a scary book. It's not fearful if you know him. Now, if you don't know him and you don't want to come into the light, yeah, it's fearful. If you don't want to be like in the light with him and you don't want to grow, then yeah, it could be a scary thing. And if you don't know him, yeah, that's not going to be a good day. But you can't know him. And you can't have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. You can walk in the light and be in his presence and not run from his presence. Because there's one who's worthy. There's one who is our kinsman, redeemer, our, our goel. That is a, like us, flesh and blood, that redeemed all mankind. And that was God's plan from the beginning. From the foundations of the world. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that, Holy Spirit, you can make sense of everything I just did today all over the place. Um, God, I pray that you redeem our time. Lord, let us apply the good news to our life. Lord, correct our theology. God, every single one of us. And I, God, you've fixed me a handful of times, and you're not done. Lord, help us rightly divide the word of truth. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you give us the mind of Christ. Lord, I pray also, Lord, that you give us, I pray for the division. It's, it's so interesting to see the terms that people are saying, calling pre-trib people demonic, demonically inspired doctrine. God, put a cease to that. Lord, let us love one another. Let us have unity with one another. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that, that eschatology is not, a, should not be a division amongst brothers and sisters. It should bring us together. We should be excited about what you're, you're doing, Jesus. And Lord, I pray for healing. Lord, if I've offended people, because I know, Lord, I can be strong. And I get excited about your word. And I know at times people aren't with me throughout the week when I'm finding these discoveries and hearing what you're showing me and seeing it and getting excited. Lord, I don't want to see people misled. I don't want people to be afraid of, of reading from you and seeing from you. When you say, blessed is everyone who reads from this book. So we don't want to keep you unveiled. But we want to walk in the light. Jesus, thank you for being as awesome as you are. And we don't even hardly know how awesome you are. <laughs> what a journey it's going to be to explore and, and discover how awesome you really are. Thank you, Lord, for being with us in this time. Lord, I pray for traveling mercies and just healing for the sicknesses and diseases. Lord, you're greater than those things. Lord, we just surrender all of those things to you. Lord, be with the Root family. Lord, Holy Spirit, come alongside as you do. You're the paraclete, the one who walks alongside of and carry them and nourish them and strengthen them and love on them as only you can. And Lord, I pray you just keep revealing more and more truth about that day. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You are dismissed. If you don't know him, church, if there's anyone in here and you don't know him, I'd love to introduce you to him. Come up and let me know, and I will introduce you to Jesus. <laughs>